We want to help people make money. We want to create businesses that are sustainable and recurring. I always say we want to be a $10 billion company. When I say that, I say I want 9 billion go to my customers and a billion go to me. And that's how I know I'll be successful. Fundamentally, our job is to create the tools for the experts so that they can bring them into the businesses and create the value without any customization or coding or AI or anything else. You get all of that stuff out of the gate. So CRMs and social media posting and two-way texting, all this stuff in high level by default. You can white label it, you can put your name on it and you can sell it on a monthly recurring basis above 97 bucks a month. Our pricing is static and flat. So the pricing we do, 297 a month, you get unlimited sub accounts and think about it as like unlimited customers. We're working on a full Shopify sort of replication and we've got our basic e-com already. I guarantee you we'll get hip to the drop shipping a lot faster. I've been in SaaS my whole career. We're creating revenue streams for our customers. We're helping them grow businesses. More importantly, we're helping them achieve life goals. Thank you so much for your time today, Sean. Um, how I first came about you was I had another guest on my podcast called Damien Watts and he was talking very highly about your service and, and sort of like how customer centric you are. And then I came across these other guys on YouTube and they were talking about the sort of full service pack that you guys are creating and how they were talking about school.com and what sort of Sam Ovens was doing. And, and they were talking about how like you guys are sort of also doing what ClickFunnels have done. And I was like, wow, like I want to hear about what Go Level was up to. And that's exactly why I reached out to you. Well, sounds good. Sean, please give sort of the audience a bit of an intro on sort of who you are and sort of what you're currently focused on. And then we'll sort of take it from there. Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Sean. I'm the co-founder of Pileable, which is kind of like an all-in-one sales and marketing and CRM platform for marketers, agencies, entrepreneurs, you name it, small businesses, that kind of thing. That's amazing. How old is the company now? And I think I've seen like... Uh, I think we're a little over five years. We just celebrated our fifth anniversary. That's amazing. And I think I saw like the growth of the company has been insane. I think, I don't know if it was outdated, but you talked about having over a hundred employees. Um, I think there was like a valuation of like- 800 employees. 800. Whoa. Yeah, we'll drop by a factor of eight. <laughs> what I was surprised is that, you know, your calendar link was on, on your LinkedIn and, and I'm not too sure if like a team member helps sort of schedule your day, but like even at where the company is at, your personal calendar link is on your LinkedIn bio. Of course. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll talk to anybody. I don't have anyone to help me with my schedule though. That's amazing. How do you schedule your day? Do you spend sort of mornings talking to clients, talking to like people and then? Yeah. Um, well, so I have an engineering background and we're kind of a product of an engineering company. So if you were to look at my day, I start the day talking almost always with the product team. So one of the product teams for one of the um, parts of the app. And I do that with my other two co-founders because we care a lot about what are we working on? How, where is it at? What direction are we taking? How is that helping our customers? So product is really the focus of the company. Uh, and then from there, I would say I spend most of my day either in hopefully a minimum number of corporate meetings or, um, and then the rest of my time spent talking one-on-one -on -one with customers whenever possible. And that's amazing. When you sort of talk about sort of product and focusing on product, are you sort of yeah. pushing out features? Are you just sort of looking at the yeah. final product and making sure it looks clean? No, I mean, if you look at the way our, we design our company, like a lot of people say customer focused or obsessed or whatever. And I would say we're all of those things, but I would say we're also customer driven and customer led. So, you know, all of our customers can go to an ideas list. They can vote up the ideas that, that tell us what they want us to build and then vote. And then based on that order, that's actually how we decide the roadmap. And so every quarter, we literally have a product team now that's quite large that's split amongst all the different features or areas of the app. They go into the ideas list, they pull off the top, you know, five, 10 ideas, figure out, you know, based on, um, you know, how many developers do we have in that area, based on hiring models, based on total amount of work for that or lift for that feature, and basically plan out their quarter that way. Once that's sort of, and we do it, we only really plan a quarter in advance so we can be incredibly flexible. And then from there, it's as we move through the quarter, you know, where are we at with that roadmap and how are we doing in terms of meeting the goals? And, and then also the big thing is for me, the most exciting thing every day is when a feature goes out, I can't wait to tell everybody about it because one way or another, it's really a, uh, when a feature comes out, it's, it's, it's really saying, Hey, listen, for all of you who wanted this feature and voted on it, uh, here it is. And then for everybody else who maybe didn't vote on it, it's probably still likely to be something you're excited about. So we really want to make sure that everybody knows when something big comes out that it's available um, and ready to go.
That's amazing. I have like two developers and they sort of helped me build out sort of study.com, which is sort of like an education LMS. And, you know, I find that it would take maybe a year and a half to just build out sort of what I'm looking for. And then it will take the exact same time, a year and a half, just to clean the last 10% cleaning bugs, cosmetic issues, buttons not working. Do you have any advice for that? Is that normal where the last 10% takes as much time as the first 90%? Yeah, so I mean, we use uh, something that I read about. The biggest thing to learn about me is I'm I'm not very good with original ideas, so I always just look for smarter people to to really steal from, more or less. And uh, when it comes to the way we develop, there was a great article. Uh, I think it's out of 2016, so it's a little old now, but it's called the skateboard model, essentially. And the idea is, you know, when you ask a human being like, well, what do you want? You know, what type of vehicle would you want? Everyone would say like, oh, I want a race car. And the problem with that is that's probably true. They do want a race car. But before you get to the race car, the question really is like, well, what race car do you see in your mind versus what race car do I see in my mind? And then from there, how do you go about building it? And I think one of the, the ways most people seem to think about building race cars is they're going to build a wheel and then they're going to build an axle and then another wheel and then they're going to put a body on it. And then the problem with that is you end up with this elongated development cycle that at no point during that development cycle, except the very end, does is anything apparent to the user? So first and foremost, p- users get it wrong all the time. So they say things that they think they need, but then they don't need, or they describe a problem in a solution, but the solution isn't maybe the best solution for the problem. So we do this radically differently. So when they say they want a race car, the, our first mission is to come out with a skateboard. So we come out with a skateboard, the way we think about it is any new feature, we have to figure out how do we come out with that feature in 45 days or less. And we come out with a skateboard version of that feature and something really amazing happens. The first and most amazing thing is, Some of the people who said they wanted a race car, you hand them the skateboard and they try it out and they say, you know what? Turns out I can use this skateboard and boom, they skateboard off and they're very happy. A lot of people will say, this thing's not a race car. I said, I want a race car. It's a skateboard. What's the deal? And then we're like, that's cool. Well, but what do we, you know, what's the next thing you'd like to see? And all of a sudden the skateboard becomes a scooter, becomes a bicycle, becomes a motorcycle. And as you progress along, the reality is, is that many, 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 many people use and enjoy aspects of that vehicle before it ever enters that final stage or gets to a maturity level where you could really call it a race car. And so all the way along, you're getting feedback, all the way along, you're creating value. It's a way better way to develop product um, and to get out in the hands of your customer. Yeah, and then now I'm just sort of trying to think of all the different founders and the different models they took out, like Mark Zuckerberg was just pushing out things fast and, and having them break, fixing them quickly. But then people like Steve Jobs were like maybe perfectionists and only shipping out products that were completely perfected. Well, you just, you all, and also just realize you just described a hardware guy and a software guy. So there's a big difference there, right? Mm, that's true, very true. Yeah, hard, like, to, I, hard to go back and re-architect a piece of hardware. And even in software, like we probably are slower to develop apps on the uh, features on the mobile app than we are in the desktop app because you you mess up on the de- the, the mobile app much harder to you know quick fix and push out an update. So there's definitely you got to think about those barriers when you're thinking about your model. When I thought about my engineering career, um, I liked software a heck of a lot more than I like hardware because I, I I like to go fast and I like to break stuff. And I'd hate the idea of, of, you know, designing a physical thing. How do you go about avoiding sort of your product being too overcrowded with too many features where it's intimidating for a new person to come in and be like, man, there's just so much going on. I don't know where to start. Yeah. I mean, I think to be fair, you don't entirely. There's this perception reality game you play. We call it give someone what they want, give them what they need. So the reality is, is if you don't have the feature that the person wants in that moment, you really lose them in the conversation. So it doesn't matter that you think you have the best whatever. If they're not interested in that in that moment, then you're wasting their time. Like they're going to just like skip you, right? So having a ton of features has a massive positive in the fact that people will say, oh my gosh, you have this and you have this and you have this and have this. Okay, great. Boom, I'm in, right? From there, it's really about saying, okay, well, how can we get you to value? But the good news there is even in products that are way more quote unquote focused, the strong reality is all of those people still have onboarding issues. Even people who would argue that they know their avatar really well and they only have the features their avatars need. If you go and look at the individual experiences of those people, I still don't think it radically changes the dynamics of the onboarding experience. It still has a lot of friction. It has a lot, a lot of lack of understanding. And really the idea uh, is you're going to have to get in there and help people. And so what we do is we have a Zoom-based onboarding and ongoing support mechanism so that we actually get on calls just like this 
and we help people set up their accounts. And I think that what that allows us to do is really understand their needs. Because again, back to the more focused apps, the reality is people don't buy them for any different reason than they buy us. They have an objective they're trying to hit and they're hoping the features of those of that app gets them to that objective. But at the end of the day, they're really still focused on the objective. So when you, when you really talk to people, they're more interested in saying, hey, I have the following objective, can you help me reach it? And if you, even if you have a more focused set of features, unless the objective is so simple that everyone's doing the same thing, which that just means you don't have a very big product or a very useful product, then you're gonna need to get on a, com uh, on a call and have a conversation to at least get them started, at least get to that first value point. Yeah, like what's your thoughts on sort of this white labeling model you guys have versus a more freemium model such as school.com or using Facebook groups or um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, everything we do is because of our customers, right? So early on, we we worked with a lot of marketers and agencies who had the following experience. They would come in, have a client. The client would say, look, I want you to help me grow my business. They'd say, great, we can help you with that. But we need you to go out and also buy this piece of software, whatever it is. And the same thing would happen regardless of the software. The client would buy the software. The agency would pour their heart and soul into making it work. And things would start to happen. And then they would, then the small business would get the bill and they'd say, well, okay, wait, I'm paying $500 a month for the software and I'm paying $5,000 a month for you. Guess what, buddy? You're gone because <laughs> the software apparently is the magic secret sauce. But that was nonsense. And it's always been nonsense. It always be nonsense, right? But that doesn't matter from ask the agency who just got fired how it feels. It feels terrible. So when you white label, what you're doing is you're sort of, you're taking that equation away and you're also giving an opportunity to the agency to do something radical, which is, okay, let's say you still do fire me on the software. Well, hold on, I mean, on the service. Hold on, wait, why can't I just make money off the software? And that's exactly what the white label allows you to do. You can sell both a service and a piece of software. And when the client fires you on the service, you continue to be in there on the software. And then it becomes a way less abrupt situation because they're not severing the relationship with you entirely. They're simply transitioning, you see, to a new lower, quote unquote, lower bill with you. And this is the beauty of it. The reality is it allows your services to come in and come out, but you don't lose them as a client. And you've just picked up a revenue stream that for you is 98% you know, margin profit and allows you to stay a vendor. And, and most of our agencies have moved over to what we call SaaS mode or SaaS become SaaSpreneurs, where what they're doing is they're deriving a massive amount of revenue and more importantly, a massive amount of profit from selling software and using the services almost as just an add-on product. Because the reality is services don't scale. They're incredibly bespoke most of the time. And they just lead to a very a sort of hamster wheel situation. Whereas the SaaS mode allows you to really scale a business and become your own software company. Oh, please update me on sort of the SaaS sort of world right now. You know, a few years ago, if you wanted to have a SaaS company, you'd probably have to hire your own in-house developers or maybe outsource that. But with AI, I don't know what how Go Level sort of does it, but can people build their own sort of softwares nowadays and just host yeah, it on? So the first thing is we want to, uh, if you look at the feature ubiquity, so if you look at the features that most people use, they're incredibly common and standard. So out of, without any customization or coding or AI or anything else, you get all of that stuff out of the gate. So CRMs and social media posting and two-way texting and da, da 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 like all this stuff, email marketing and on and on and on. All that stuff in high level by default. You can white label it. You can put your name on it. You can And you can sell it on a monthly recurring basis for whatever you want above 97 bucks a month. That's our minimum sort of price. And from there, you can do anything else you want. You want to add on stuff, great. We've got great developer support, all of that. But you do not need to be an engineer. You do not need to write any code. Um, in fact, you don't need to even customize it. Um, you can literally white label it, walk out your front door and sell it to every small business in your community for whatever you want. And our pricing is static so and flat. So the pricing we do, it's like $2.97 a month. You get unlimited sub accounts and think about it as like unlimited customers. $97 a month, it's three customers. The reality is whether at the $2.97 level, whether you have 10 clients or 100 clients or 1,000 clients, you don't pay us any more money. So our pricing is incredibly flat. How do clients, like with this model, won't these sort of customers eventually just go directly to you guys? Go directly no. to go high level? No, 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 no. This is where there's a massive mistake in people's perspective. If you buy a direct, that's sort of saying like, well, I was going to have my home remodeled, but. But then I found out that the home remodeler actually buys all of their tools at the hardware store. So instead, I went to the hardware store and bought all the tools, and I decided to remodel it myself. You just sound like an idiot when you do that, right? Because everyone knows that you don't know how to remodel a house. And if you really look at most of these businesses that are being served, they do something, you know, like a real thing. Like, I don't care if they're a plumber or replacing toilets. I don't know about you, but me personally, I don't know how to replace a toilet. I bet if you hired me to do it, I would screw it up, and you'd be very unhappy with my outcome. And it actually is a vocation. And that's the point. Saying that I can be a great marketer 
and a great uh, plumber. Sorry, that's not the same thing. That's like saying I'm, I'm going to be a great accountant and a great you know lawyer. It's not the same thing. Like these are real vocations. And so what happens is most businesses, when you ask them about software products they bought or CRMs that they have, they have, they hate them. Because they're like, I don't know, I know I'm supposed to have one, but it's like hundreds of dollars a month. It just sits there and does nothing. And this is where the marketer or the agency just changes the equation because they're there not only to uh, put a product in place, but to make that product create an outcome while the business owner is actually out doing the thing they know how to do. That's beautiful. Has this always been the business model or did it mold to this model over the last five years? Yeah, so our first two and a half years, it was really about becoming the agency operating system. So if you looked out there, or at the marketer operating system, if you looked out there, there really was no platform whatsoever that took all of the products that agencies needed it under one tent, which is what we did. That um, We also made it multi-tenant, which meant you could have you know N number of clients in there, and you could seamlessly jump in, in and out of client accounts as the marketer or as the agency. And But clients could also log in. The clients would see their stuff, right? each client individually, but you as the marketer could move in move in and out seamlessly. So that was the first step. Build the features the marketer needed all in one spot, make it multi tenant, make it white label. And then we actually discovered that lots of our clients were already selling high level on a monthly recurring basis as a SaaS offering. And it was radically changing their business. And so once we discovered that, we're like, holy cow, this is amazing. So we literally just came out with it as a model. Um, and we started just telling all the other people about it. And it has been a huge game changer. And then what we started off with was just marketers and agencies. And we thought, well, this will just be a way for them to evolve their business model. But then people started starting with this business model without ever being an agency. And that worked great as well. Because the reality is, is if you think about the way in which most people buy software, it's ads, it's some salesperson, it's a bunch of cold email. It's like, it's annoying, right? And once you buy it, they vanish into thin air because they already got their commission. And now you're just left in the dark with a piece of software. Versus if you get it from a SaaSpreneur, these people generally are local in your community. They'll come down and help you. They'll come down and talk to you. They'll fill in the gaps between that that the, the thing the tool does and the thing you actually need. Like, hey, it's got a website builder? Fantastic. Uh, who knows how to build a website? Or who can help me build a website? Well, don't worry because our SaaSpreneurs can do that for you versus... Some software companies like, I don't know, man, we, we're a web, it's a website builder. Like it's a tool, use it or not. Like end, end solutions versus just tools, totally different outcomes. Do you have to balance between helping the SaaSpreneurs and helping the SaaSpreneurs customers? We don't help the SaaSpreneurs customers. And we do in the sense that the product, from a product perspective, we always say, listen, how can we make sure that this is, you know, like the plumber can use this as best as possible. Although we serve the SaaSpreneur and the SaaSpreneur serves the plumber, right? And that's why the SaaSpreneur gets a revenue stream out of it. That's why we don't take a piece of their revenue. We allow them to grow a business and we allow them to make enough money that they are have a scalable, profitable business, but also one that has the capacity to hire support people as they grow and things like that. So, you know, we have people that have 10 clients and 10 sub accounts and we have people that have 10,000 sub accounts. So we have an incredible difference in scale at this point. So we've seen it done many different ways. But the most important thing is every client you're picking up, you're not paying us another dollar. And as a result, you're building a sustainable, scalable business. I love how like customer centric you guys are. Like I, I remember reading your bio on LinkedIn, it says like sort of focus on customers and guarantee your customers result. Like how do you guys guarantee customer results? How do you guys sort of lay out that roadmap where you're like, no, you have a proven formula for their success? Well, we measure it. So we have full invoicing and billing and all of this in our app. And we have the, 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 the sort of marketers and agencies and SaaS producers that use this built through the app. So we look, we just make sure that we are, we're, we're actually creating revenue streams for them. And then when new features come out, we always say, okay, wait a second. If this feature, let's say, like we have, like we came out with WordPress hosting, right? Well, WordPress hosting is going to cost us some money. It has, there's a servers component to it, this and that, but we didn't just say, okay, well, you're going to have to pay us X dollars a month customer for the WordPress hosting, if you use it, we said, okay, wait a second, we're going to charge you X, but we're also going to build in so that you can also add in your own markup. So all of a sudden, this new feature and product that our customers asked us for now also comes with a revenue component for them. So they're able to make money off of it automatically. What's your ideal customer? Is it agencies, sort of business owners with clients already, or do you work with people with no clients and you help them get clients as well? Something super important here. We are product and engineers. So Perfect fits are always people who already have customers, right? We work with a lot of coaches and uh, and that sort of thing. And, and, and to us, that's incredibly important because the thing we would say is, 
We love brand new entrepreneurs. We have some basics on how we would tell you to go out and make money, but we're not a coach. We're not coaches ourselves. And we respect the fact there are many different ways to do this. And so if you're a brand new entrepreneur, we love it when the, you could sort of connect with one of our coaches and come in through them essentially, because then we know you have a plan and a, and a software product. Um, because if you just show up at our door, we, I, I can absolutely tell you my opinion on what I would tell you to do to go out and make money, but it's pretty basic. It, 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 I think, it, I think it is actually pretty functional as well, but all the stuff coaches bring is, isn't something that we bring. That's not who we are. We really want to work with those people. And again, it's, it's because there's so many different ways to do it. Um, we don't want to try to help people like we're the end all be all of coaching. Things like really a product engineering sort of company, how do you guys go about sort of building marketing tools, sales tools, and sort of tapping into that world? I mean, we have all of those things. I mean, we, we do it through our customers, right? So our customers, I mean, you know, we have the drag and drop, uh, you know, opportunities board. We have inbound and outbound calling and voicemail and IVR and ring all for sales teams. And we have the ability to have it so that you can assign lead, you can like have a user be it like essentially a salesperson where they see only their leads and the other sales people only see their leads, but then the manager sees all the leads. And all of that has been developed over the last five years due to customer feedback. We have really big sales teams that use our product. So if a customer was like, hey, with my outbound sales calls, I want a feature where the number will be localized based on the customer call, you guys would then build that out. I say, listen, go to ideas.gohighlevel.com. You get me the votes, I'll get you the feature. And then are you guys literally just working on the most voted things or do you look at the top 10 and pick the ones that feel like a right fit. So we have the app divided into a bunch of different categories. So if you go to the ideas list, you'll see the categories. And then within each of those categories, there's a product manager who owns that category and they're going off the top ideas and they're literally just marching down. And like, do you guys eventually want to like make everything? Like for example, the booking link I use to speak with us, is that your own? And then do you guys want to eventually create Zoom and create like a video calling service? Cause that's- Yeah, video, video calling will probably happen later this year. Wow. Yeah. And like, let's say there's a big project such as video calling. There's already a bunch of existing sort of video calling services that you can model after. How long would it take for you guys to bring it out on your own? Well, like I said, all MVPs have, have to be 45 days or less. So we'll have version one in 45 days or less when we choose to do it. Wow. And then like how many developers would you decide? We have over 300 engineers right now, but we'll have 500 by the end of this year. And then when you have a project like this, how do you go about assigning like a product lead? How many engineers go? Yeah, we'll have a product manager and then that product manager will go out, look at the competition, figure out how, you know, like what is that absolute micro feature set that we need to develop, figure out how many engineers we need to make that happen. It's generally about two. Um, and then they they map, map, map it out and get to work. How did you go about sort of scaling to sort of 800 plus over the last five years? Were there sort of a lot of any hiring issues? Are you involved in the hiring or did you guys sort of get recruiters, hiring agencies? Oh, I mean, we have hired, no, no, no. So we, we hire everybody direct. We have a whole recruiting team. We've built them up over time. Everybody is remote. So that's another thing about us that's unique. Yeah. I mean, it's just been kind of one foot in front of the other. Nothing, no magic secret sauce. Where has been the main sort of location of most of your employees? I mean, they're all over. I mean, well, so initially they used to be everywhere, but the problem we ran into was as you get, I mean, as you get larger, there's a huge tax implication. So like in the United States, for example, if I have one employee in New Hampshire, all of a sudden I have to have like a tax return in New Hampshire and all that. So it makes it prohibitively expensive and annoying. So we, we ended up there. We sort of domicile like within... Texas and Florida primarily, although there's a couple of people here like me in Oregon, but, uh, but in general, and then uh, my, so I have two co-founders, one's in Dallas, the other's in Qatar, but the guy in Qatar, he and I go way back. Um, he's from India. So uh, we hired our entire development team is in India, but they're all direct hires. So there are all of our employees. We don't have, we don't outsource anything. We don't use the external vendors. We have a whole HR team there. We, we have an entity there, all that stuff. Um, we got a couple of folks in Brazil. We got a, uh, a sort of a quadrant in uh, Canada. And then uh, these are all holdovers from our early days. And then uh, we also have a team in uh, the Philippines that used to be a holdover team, but now we're finally big enough that we're actually gonna start to directly hire there. And then we also have people in Mexico and all over. That's crazy. That's so cool. When it comes to hiring, like I hire a lot of people from the Philippines, the majority of my team are from the Philippines and I have a few members in Australia and you know, there is a salary discrepancy. I can't pronounce that word. Do you have a set rate for every engineer or will it depend on sort of their location and their skill and yeah. there's that much variability so we do like the big company thing so what we do is we do salary surveys and we buy all kinds of salary data 
um, from all the different countries for all the different positions and the different roles. And then we pay relative to that country. So, but we always skew towards the generally the 75th plus percentile um, in all the countries we hire. What's your like day to like how many hours are you, are you working? Because like, man, 800 employees, like what's your day to day life? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not managing all those people directly. So I have some really good team members. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the work is pretty nonstop, uh, 24-7, 365. I mean, obviously I sleep, but um, but yeah, just always, I mean, we're, we're growing all the time. And so there's a lot of work to be done. How do you stay switched on? And like, uh, you know, during this interview, you're so quick and, and you're really switched on. Do you not get burnt out working day to day? Like, how do you maintain this high energy? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I try to take some time out here and there and I hang out with my family at night and that kind of thing. But I mean, I also have these, I think what really is amazing is my customers, right? So when you're sort of community driven, like we are, it's really awesome because you're not isolated on this little island. You have all these different people who are constantly doing things with your product and you're you're like in there, we're a partner with them really, right? So it, you know, day to day, being able to watch what people are doing with it is pretty incredible. And so I think it just kind of keeps me motivated and keeps me going. Where's sort of the long-term vision for the company? Do you, are you guys pushing for an exit in five, 10 years? Do you see you running this company for the next 50 years? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know. People who seem to be able to look forward like that, that's just not how I am. I'm more of like a heads down kind of guy. So I don't have a plan at all either way. Um, we, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. I have some awesome co-founders. We work with great people. I, and more importantly, I think we're changing. I've been in SaaS my whole career. And I think we're changing the dynamics by which we're going to market. We're really enabling our customers to become businesses in their own right. And we're not selling like every other SaaS company. We're creating revenue streams for our customers. We're helping them grow businesses. We're helping them achieve. More importantly, we're helping them achieve life goals, right? We're helping them leave jobs or buy cars or buy houses or go on vacations or whatever it is that they want to do in their lives. And to me, that is a much more thrilling concept. I really feel like we're democratizing um, the power of software to change people's lives off our direct customers to create businesses for themselves, but also for them to then use that to help them change the lives of the small businesses that they serve. And so for me, it's a radically different way by which to go about it. And it's pretty awesome. So I don't know, as long as that fun continues, why stop? A lot of our audiences are coaches and sort of agency owners. Do you have any advice to sort of um, coaches? Like how can they better help get their customers results? Because it's hard. It feels like it's, you know, you have to, you can't convince someone to eat healthy every day. You can't convince someone to complete the homework and life hits them and, and you know, they procrastinate. How do coaches coaches get their students and their clients results using a similar mindset? Well, I, I think there's two things. What the coaches we work with um, generally also what they do is they pair high level with their course because what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, most of the time, I don't care if you're coaching, um, you know, course creators or small business owners or agencies or whatever, fundamentally they need a tech stack. And what we try to do is we have this thing called snapshot. So the idea is like, if I'm a coach, all the assets, almost every coach has assets. Like, hey, I need, I want you to take this landing page with these social media posts and these automation flows and da, 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 and go build this in this bit in, in these six different products. <laughs> High level is more like, hey, here's a link. When you go and sign up, it'll import all these different uh, things into high level for you, one click. And so you won't actually have to build any of that stuff it's just ready in there for you. So it makes ex time to execution very fast. I and mean, this is always the hang up, right? If I'm a student and I buy into the coach, I get a philosophy, I get a, I get, I get some kind of plan, but then when it comes down to sitting and doing the execution, it's a bear. And so what we try to do is reduce the friction there. So it makes it much, much, much easier. And then when the coach says, Oh, you know what? I've got a new funnel or a new set of social media posts or a new, uh, you know, whatever they can literally want, like add it in one time, click a button one time and push it out to every single student, just like that. So all of a sudden as a student, who's then now paying this coach on an ongoing basis, I'm getting fresh content in addition to like fresh assets, real tangible things versus just fresh advice. So I'm getting both and it makes coaches lives a lot easier when they're talking to their students. Interesting. So I'm in sort of the e-commerce education space and I know a lot of, I have a lot of friends that teach sort of people how to build their own online business and like our students, they have to, you know, make a Shopify store, use apps like DS's to link supplies from China to the Shopify store, use Canva to make a logo, use GoDaddy to get a domain. Yeah. So we're eating back against this. So like, e so e-com is, is actually a big part of this year. So, uh, the way we look at e-com is we're working on a full Shopify sort of replication. And we've got our basic e-com already. And then the other big thing that we hear about a lot is um, in e-com is, is marketing apps like Clavio. 
So what we'll do is we'll start on the Clavio direction. So it's easier to like knock Clavio out than it'll be to knock Shopify out. So we'll kind of come through the back door there. Um, and so the idea would be, th that's exactly what I would say. I would say, hey, all right, get, go get high level because it's got a great Shopify integration. You can do the email ROI trick that Clavio does. You can do the SMS marketing, the email marketing. It's radically cheaper. You also get the CRM and the funnel builder and blah, 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 all this stuff. And I've already got it pre-canned for you, ready to go. And then over time, we'll build forward because what do we know about Shopify? We know that their average uh, revenue per store is about $92 a month. So these are micro merchants. You know, you go to the website and they're going to show you the big stuff. But we all know if you're really doing this in the real world, these are very tiny stores. So we know that over the long term, we'll be able to win there. And again, all the other tools that you need to really run a store. And again, because we work with our customers, I guarantee you we'll get hip to the drop shipping a lot faster than most people. And um, because we'll know that if you're in the business of teaching someone how to run, create an e-com store, one of the big problems is how do I get stuff? You get stuff from the drop, drop shipping stuff. You're not going to have a warehouse for if ever for a long time. So yeah, that's how our development roadmap will go there. Your business model of just like putting everything in one is amazing. I'm thinking like, why hasn't this done before? Like for example, let's say someone wants to become a YouTuber. Why hasn't a company created editing software that can edit video and photos and also has like a hiring base where you can hire editors, basically copy YouTube and, and Facebook and, and combine it all into one where... I mean, on the, on the software side, there's been a big philosophy shift. And, and well, there is a philosophy shift happening. If you think about the old philosophy, it was you want the best product out there for the one thing that it does. And now, you, so now what that really means in the real world is go buy 30 things and hope that you can you can sort of stitch them together with Zapier. But everyone who's tried that knows that it sucks. It doesn't, it doesn't work and it sure the heck doesn't scale. So now what? The problem is when you look at the individual pieces of software, they also end up siloing themselves. So think about it like if you're a video recording software or something. Every day, you just wake up and you're like, what else can I do? What else can I do? What else can I do? And you don't think, how else can I serve my customer? You think, how else do I create another video recording feature? But when you really look at the overlay of most people's usage of a product versus the features, they, they use about 20% of the darn feature set. So what does that mean? That means like 80% of the features are essentially a waste of time or for a very small user base. And so we sort of take the, what we do is we say, listen, what's that 20%? Because we're going to drive at that and we're going to do great at the 20%. And whether we get to the, we'll get to the rest later. But today we know if we get to the 20%, most people can use this just fine. And then if you do that with 20 or 30 different products, all of a sudden, no more Zapier. You're literally seamlessly talking between each other and magic starts to happen because all the data it lives in one spot. So you can start to do cool attribution. AI starts to get really interesting. And as a just a, as a user, you can see all the places people came from, what actions they took, you know, what made them successful, all of that. So you can actually grow and scale your business a lot more efficiently. I was just trying to think like who else is doing a similar thing. And I just realized like the, the amount of vertical integration you guys are getting, you guys are similar to like what Salesforce, Oracle, HubSpot, they're like these big giant companies, yeah. they're trying to. Except we are not enterprise and we don't want to be, right? And we don't charge like they do. So you're never going to pay us $3,000 a month. We don't have, no, we, we don't have per contact pricing and per user pricing and all that crap. You go look at our pricing, it's flat. And there's like, there's no tricks. There's no jokes. There's like, no, there's no like gotchas. It's not how we roll. And, you know, the way we've gotten there is we don't have this massive sales team and running around calling everybody, trying to convince them to sign up for our product. We we work with people who are already our customers. We have a, a really awesome affiliate program where we pay people 40% recurring for life. And we literally say, hey, listen, if you use our product and you like it, just tell two of your friends. And if you like it, you can explain to them why it's useful. And you can get 40% recurring every month for doing so. Your account gets free. Their account, they come in and paid. And hopefully they tell two friends after that. And literally that is our business. That is how we've gotten here. Yeah, I was about one of the questions I wrote down is acquisition. Like, do you guys run ads? Do you do affiliate or is it all organic? All, it's all affiliates. So our customers tell other people, because here's how I think about it. Like if someone says like, what does high level do? Like you asked me at the beginning of the interview, I barely can describe it. And the number of features just goes on for days. And again, telling someone like, uh, we make hammers and saws and screwdrivers and drill bits. And like, at some point it's like, Ugh, right. But, and when you hear from your friend though, and they're like, Hey man, let me show you this awesome thing I did. And you look at it and you're like, that's amazing. That's a way cooler way to get to be introduced to a product. And that's how we do it. 
And then with when you do word of mouth and organic, you can't really predict how many new leads or new calls or new sort of free trials you get. How do you go ahead and balance the sales team or the account managers? And we well, like we don't have a sales team, so but, but we don't balance that. Um, it's all free trial. So come to our website, sign up, 14 year free trial. Like everybody comes up and signs up for a trial. So we balance the number of people that come in and sign up for free trials. That tells us how many people do need an onboarding team, how many people do need the support team and all of that. Um, but we don't have to, we don't have to do any of the account management kind of stuff. With the onboarding team, is that team stagnant or will it fluctuate based on how many signups you're getting at that quarter? Um, like it, it, it mostly just grows. So uh, yeah, it's 24 seven, 365 at this point, which is really cool. So literally anytime, anywhere, any time zone, you jump into zoom, you can do it before you sign up. Even you can do it after you sign up. doesn't matter to us. We'll talk to you and um, help you get started. And then as soon as your trial converts, you, you we don't dump you on the side of the road and say, good luck. We actually hand you off to a whole nother Zoom team whose whole job it is, is to help you continue to implement and get things um, where you want it to go. This is amazing. Sean, what's your thoughts on AI? Like, is AI just going to make like things cheaper? Like, as you said, like you don't do things like enterprise, like is there a race to the bottom? Yeah, no, I don't think, I mean, no, I, I think that if you look at, so I think AI is like an accelerant. It's a tool that allows you to do the same thing you were doing yesterday, just radically faster and radically cheaper should, should mean you can do a lot more of it. We have a ton of AI in the system. We have a full conversational AI bot. We do AI text generation, AI lead generation. And again, we're following our customer, right? Are we see marketers using AI tools to accelerate the production of the things that they are already doing for their clients, which simply means that they could do a lot more for them. And I just think of it, I always say it's like, it's like you're cutting down trees today with an ax and tomorrow I show up and hand you a chainsaw. You still have to know how to cut down a tree because if any idiot tries to cut down a big tree with a chainsaw, they're liable to kill themselves, let alone um, do a good job cut th cutting things down fast. So I think of it as an enhancement to the tool set that the professionals are using. That's it. What's your thoughts on customers want versus need? For example, everyone wanted the aux cord to be in the iPhone, but Apple was like, hey, you don't need that. Yeah, so you know what we find is if you don't, this is the whole sell them what they want, give them what they need. So if you don't meet people where they stand, you're basically saying at some level, listen, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Let me convince you why you're wrong. That's not the position we take because we find that A, that's a heck of a bad way to get started off with a customer. And it really also runs counter to this idea of that your customer actually knows what they're doing. We sort of give the customer the onus that and respect that they know what they're doing. And it doesn't mean we don't want to talk to them. Like maybe we, maybe we're confused. Maybe we think we have a better idea, but we're certainly not going to come out and say, no, you are wrong. What we would say is, oh, really? That's interesting. Let's get on a call like this. And can you talk me through what you're trying to achieve? Because sometimes that, I mean, it goes both ways. I learn so much from my customer every day, but sometimes I say, well, okay, wait, so the problem you're trying to solve is this. What if instead of that solution, we did this solution? What do you think? And it's amazing. People will be like, oh, you know what? That is a better solution sometimes. So it's really a collaborative effort. You just can't be one-sided. When companies used to focus on one main tool and, and perfect that, they would have one or two competitors. You guys are attacking like 50 different verticals. Does that mean you, yeah. you have 50 competitors awesome. tapping on a bunch of toes? You no, we don't have competitors because I mean, I mean, we do and we don't, right? I mean, sure, sure, sure. On the feature set side, we do, but that's that's not what we see our business. Like if it was just features, right? It was like, oh, I make hammers, I make saws, I mean, blah, 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 blah. like that's not me. That's not what we do. We actually, we create tools for professionals because here's the secret we believe. We think that the goal is not to get the individual plumber or lawyer or doctor or dentist to figure out how to also be a great marketer and a great CRM person or a great software person. That, that just doesn't make sense. Like I was used to love, the, the analogy I was used to say is like, well, let's say you go to the dentist, right? And you got to get a cavity drill and you sit down and they get you all numb and everything else. And he pulls out the drill and says, oh, you know what? You're in the marketing space, right? Oh, you know what? I've spent the last three months really focusing hard on learning funnels and follow-up sequences and everything else. Uh, how does this drill work again? Oh, never mind. I'll, I'll try to remember. Let's get going. You'd be like, oh my God, get me out of the seat. Like this guy's going to drill my teeth. That's insane. That's the point, right? People need to have expertise to do a great job and marketing, sales, CRM, software, that is an expertise. And so fundamentally our job is to create the tools for the experts so that they can bring them into the businesses and create the value versus everybody else, in my opinion, somehow seeks to get the dentist or the lawyer or the plumber to actually also be the CRM person, a software person. And I think that's crazy. 
with when it comes to software and replication, can you get sort of like sued or, or is there copyright or is that completely fine in, in the sort of software space and there isn't any legalities to sort of just like... We, we don't take anyone's stuff, right? All the code is our own. So is, think about it like this. When you get in your car today and you look at that steering wheel and then I put you on an airplane, I fly you 3,000 miles away and you jump in another car and you look at the steering wheel, guess what? You know exactly what to do with it. But nobody's getting sued over the steering wheel. No one's getting sued over the gear shifters and the pedals because that's how cars work, right? And the same thing goes for lots of other pieces of, uh, of technology and software. But it's but again, no one would say car, car, car maker one stole car maker two's steering wheel design. That's not how it works. Fundamentally, they of course did the work. They of course put in the time. They of course created the car just as we of course created the feature wrote all the code that that product runs on. So no, I don't think we're still on anything. Two questions I used to love wrapping these interview up. One, any recent discoveries that you've started to implement to your day-to-day -day life? Gosh, that's a good question. I would say that it's surprising as you get bigger, how much leadership and culture matters and figuring out how to scale that to your people. Because fundamentally, you take for granted that some of your people at this stage actually have never met you and you might never meet them, but you really need them to essentially be the same as you would be in that circumstance. So like I had a customer call me today. Um, I don't know how she got my cell phone, but I'm glad she did because she said, hey, I try to call support and they asked me for this relationship number thing and I didn't have it. And they said they couldn't help me. And and so then I, I was like, oh, well, hold on, what's your name? And I helped her. Um, but then she asked a great question, which is why the heck would uh, like, why the heck would you be able to do this? And the support person couldn't. I said, that's a great question. So I followed up and and that's the whole point. It's like, no, 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 you never say that. You never say like, I'm sorry, you don't have your like customer number. I can't help you. That's garbage. Like, give me a break. Just ask the lady her name, look her up. Let's make it happen. But that was a really good teachable moment. So that's a good change, a big change in what I've been doing recently. And then last question is, what's your goal or focus over the next six months? I think we know you, you got the Zoom, the Shopify. So I guess you already shared a bit about sort of the- Well, I mean, there's uh, really my goal is just to continue to make sure that we're doing well what we've always done, which is giving the tools to our customers to create the value for the businesses that they serve and that we don't ever get away from our core values, which are we want to help people make money. We want to create businesses that are sustainable and recurring. And we want to continue to democratize and take away from these uber high funded, you know, winner take all kind of people that have really dominated the software space and give all of that money back. I mean, I always say we want to be a $10 billion company. And what I say, when I say that, I say, I want 9 billion go to my customers and a billion go to me. And that's how I know I'll be successful. Love it, Sean. Sean, where can people find more about, just get more of you, everything yeah, that yeah. you yeah. Well, you don't want to, yeah, yeah, go to our YouTube channel. So the, A, you don't have to get more of me. You can you can see everything. You can see what we're about. You can see the software. Um, you can see interviews with people who are great marketers, like on and on and on. Our YouTube channel is definitely where you just go to YouTube, type high level, you cannot miss it. Um, it's awesome. It's a great place to learn a lot about us. And of course, we have a massive thriving Facebook community um, but it's only full of our customers. So you have to be a customer to join. So that's why I like to start with the YouTube channel, because I think that way you don't pay us a dime or you're, you're not getting on a free trial yet, but you can get a lot of exposure to our product, but also honestly to our community. That's awesome. I'll link it below. But yeah, thank you so much for your time today, Sean. I love how passionate you are. You love customers. You're so customer centric. You're definitely, you know, we can feel that you love what you do and you're so quick. I, I hit so many topics. You were just like knocking them one after another. So you're definitely like a purebred entrepreneur where you sort of have your print on literally everything despite it being that big. And I can definitely sense it because we just asked a bunch of different related questions. So thank you for your time today. Yeah, well, it's, uh, this is a great interview. You asked great questions. So you made it easy for me. Awesome, guys. If you made it this far into the episode, hopefully you guys got some value. I'll see you guys next week on another episode of the podcast. Peace.